Okay, yeah, so now we're recording. Um, and again, just another reminder, if you do have your video on, um, during the times when I'm not prevent, uh, presenting a screen or sharing a screen, then your video might be caught in the recording. So if you'd rather that didn't happen, you should turn your video off. Um, I'll also say that I did mute everyone, uh, but you do have the ability to unmute yourself. Um, I'd prefer if we could save questions until the end, but if you have one during the time that I'm presenting that you really wanna ask at that point, go ahead and, and chime right in. Um, and we're at seven now, so I think Pat will say a few words about LWA before I jump into the Loon stuff. Sure, thanks, Caroline. Um, so I'm the executive director with the Lake Winnipesaukee Association. Our organization works to protect the health of the lake and keeping it clean and blue for many generations to come. And, and what we do is really tied in very well with what the Loon Preservation Committee works to do, you know, their focus is the loons, but the loons are really good harb harbinger of water quality. So anything that our association can do to keep the lake clean and healthy benefits the loon as well. So I'm happy to turn this over to Caroline for a presentation and thank you. Great, thanks so much, Pat. And thank you for partnering with us on this presentation. Um, Winnipesaukee is really special to us at LPC, not only because it's, you know, New Hampshire's lake with the most, uh, largest lake with the most amount of loon pairs, but also because it's where our headquarters are. Um, we're up in the northwest corner at these mills. Um, and yeah, we have a, a biologist that's totally just dedicated to Lake Winnipesaukee. Um, so it's a special place, a really great place for loons. Um, and yeah, excited to be doing this presentation. Um, I do like to start off my presentations talking about loon calls because for a lot of us, um, that's one of the most interesting, fascinating, noticeable things about our loons, right? If you've been on the lake, you've probably heard loon calls. Uh, what you may not know is that loons have four main types of calls and they sort of have countless other you know, variations of calls, but the four that you'll hear the most um, are the four that I'm going to talk about now. So I have some recordings to play and then we can talk about, you know, the contexts that each of these calls are used in um, and what they mean. So we'll start off with the whale, which is a really quintessential loon call. If you've been around a lake uh, in the north, you've probably heard this call before. So hopefully everyone was able to hear that. Um, the whale is a call that is primarily used for long distance communication between mated pairs of loons. So, um, you know, the loons, when they're on the water, they don't always stay close by to their mate. They might go to opposite ends of their territory to fish. Sometimes they actually even fly to other lakes to fish there and then return to their territory. So when they come back, they might, you know, whale to find their mate and, and get back together with their mate on the water. Um, there are different versions of whales, depending on how many syllables they have, how many different frequencies are present in the call. And so the more syllables and the more frequencies present, the more frantic that loon is that's giving that call. So you might hear one of those more frantic sounding whales um, as a loon pair is beginning to engage with an intruding loon that's coming into their territory and trying to take it over. Um, and then the whale is also a really big part of the night chorus. So on large lakes like Winnipesaukee, where there are a lot of different loon pairs in a relatively small geographic area, um, they'll call back and forth to each other at night, uh, sort of as a, a roll call, you know, all the different pairs checking in. And it also helps them to become more familiar with their neighbors, the loons that have territories very close by. The second call I will play is the hoot. So it's a much softer call, a much shorter call, and one that you may not have heard unless you've been in pretty close proximity to um, a loon pair. This is a call that's used for short distance communication, again, between usually family members. So between uh, pair members and their chicks, the adults will hoot to the chicks. Um, similar to the whale, they do this in differing frequencies and depending on the frequency and the pitch of that call, um, it can denote you know, a, um, 
calmness or franticness. So a, a more high pitch who is, is often heard again in territorial interactions with other loons when the pair members are um, trying to communicate with each other about that intruding loon. I'm gonna skip over the yodel for now because it's a really, really interesting call and I just wanna save it for last. So we'll go to the tremolo first. And similar to the whale, this is one of those ones that you've probably heard before. Um, loons do this a lot. <laughs> So the tremolo is a call that is most often used to um, show alarm. So you'll see loons tremoloing whenever there's something that they perceive as a threat, whether that's, um, again, an intruding loon coming into their territory or an eagle flying overhead um, or even you know a person or a boat getting too close. Sometimes we even see loons tremoloing um, at airplanes flying overhead. Um, and we think that might be because they're mistaking it for an eagle. Tremolos are also used in the night chorus, similar to the whale. And um, the tremolo, as far as I'm aware, is the only call that loons have been recorded doing in flight. So if you hear um, a tremolo and you're not anywhere around a lake, uh, look up because there might be a loon flying overhead. And so the fourth call is the yodel. And the yodel is a really, really interesting call for a couple of different reasons. The first is that it's one of the only ways that you can tell male and female loons apart. Um, so the male and the female are virtually identical. There, there are no differences in their plumage, at least none that can be detected or detected easily by the human eye. Um, there is a slight difference in size. So males will on average be somewhere around 20% larger than the female, but not always. And even if, there are, even if they are, it can be a little bit difficult to tell that when they're on the water. Um, and especially if you're further away. So if you hear this call, then you know the, the loon you're looking at is the male because only the males will give this yodel call. So it sounds sort of like an angry seagull. This is a call that is used for territorial defense. So male loons will give this call uh, again, at anything that they perceive as a threat. So you'll see loons yodeling at uh, eagles flying overhead, at airplanes again, if they mistake it for an eagle, at boats if they get too close, and at other loons. Um, and I wanna talk a little bit more about that because it's really interesting. The yodel is a call that is unique to each loon. So other loons can recognize each male by his yodel. Um, and that's an advantage, right? If if an intruding loon is coming in and trying to decide if he wants to fight this male for his territory um, and try to take over that territory, if he can identify that individual loon that's calling at him, um, it, it, it's useful, right? Because if he's fought that loon before and lost, he knows uh, maybe I won't try my luck here. The other really cool thing about the yodel is that it it gives other loons a lot of information about the loon that's giving the call. So it tells um, information about that loon's size, about its body condition, and about its overall level of aggressiveness and willingness to fight. And so those are all important things that you need to know when you're deciding if you want to challenge that other loon to a fight, right? Um, so the, the yodel is one of the most complex calls that loons have, um, and it, there's, it's something that's still being studied by researchers, and you know we might find more information about it than we already have, um, but a very cool call that really does communicate a lot of, of different information. Okay, so now that we have talked about what loons sound like, let's jump into what they look like. So um, this is a common loon in its breeding plumage. This is what they look like when they're on our lakes. And on our lakes, we actually have some lookalike species. And, and so sometimes at the loon center, we'll get a call about a loon that has six chicks with it, or um, you know, a loon that's walking around on the beach. And when we hear that, we think it must be one of these lookalike species um, because loons will only have a maximum of two chicks each year and they can't walk around on land, right? Um, and so some of these lookalike species that are on our lakes include mergansers. So on the top left over here, we have a female merganser. Um, she's got a red bill, a gray body, and a reddish brown crest, sort of looks like a mohawk. The male mergansers are really the ones that get confused for loons most often because they are black and white. 
Um, and in certain lighting that that green head can look black. Um, but mergansers will always have that bright red bill. So you should be able to, to differentiate them between, between them and loons from that. And then also um, our loons, the white that's on them is really just on their bellies. Um, and so if you see a bird that has white much further up the sides like this, it's probably a merganser. Geese will often be um, confused for loons as well. They have similar coloring and you know, similar colored bill, but their necks are much longer um, and their backs are brown. And then the cormorants have a similar shape to loons, but they're a lot slimmer. Their necks and, and heads are a lot slimmer. And again, it doesn't have a black bill, it's got an orange bill. Um, so the, yeah, the features that we usually tell people to look for to make sure that what they're seeing is actually a loon include um, this black and white checkered pattern on the back. None of those, uh, those birds that we saw before had the checkering. Loons will also have what we refer to as the collar around the neck. That's a, a section of you know, black and white striping. Loons also have that characteristic bright red eye. And then they have this really long, sharp black bill. We refer to it as a dagger-like bill um, because it's so sharp and they actually do use it to fight each other, um, similar to how one would use a dagger. So um, if, you, if you're seeing those four characteristics, chances are that you've got a loon. But loons don't always look um, the way that they look in this picture. So if you've been around the lakes later into the season, you might have seen your loons starting to look like this. Um, this loon is in the beginning stages of its molt, and typically the molt does start up around the bill. So you'll see this one has some white feathers coming in along the bill, um, and that eventually makes its way back across the whole body so that by the time the loons are on their ocean wintering grounds, they look like this. Their coloration is completely different. They're much more drab. Um, you know, their plumage is gray and white. Even their bill does dulls down to a gray or white. Um, some loons have far more white on their bill in the winter than others. And then that eye remains red, but dulls down to really more of a brownish red. Um, and so if you didn't know that loons went through this major change, then you might not realize that the birds that you're looking at on the ocean are actually the same birds that uh, you are seeing on your lake back in the summer. And so uh, our loons do spend the winter on the ocean. Um, they need to be able to breathe and also catch fish. And obviously they can't do that as our lakes ice over. So they have to find open water. Um, from recites of banded birds on the ocean, uh, we think that our loons in New Hampshire are primarily going right over to the Gulf of Maine area. So we've had banded New Hampshire birds seen as far north as Mount Desert Island and as far south as Cape May, New Jersey. Um, but for the most part, they're off the Maine coast, the New Hampshire coast, and the Massachusetts coast. Um, and they stay there until their lakes ice out. And the really cool thing about our loons here in New Hampshire and in other states as well, is that they're very well known for returning to their lake essentially the day that the ice goes out. Um, and so we think that what they're doing is making recon trips to check on their lake because um, you know the flight is so short that they can do it without expending a ton of energy. Um, and so migration is partially triggered by photo periods, so the lengthening, the lengthening of the days. So as they start to realize that the breeding season is approaching, we think they are taking trips back and forth to their lake to check on it, see if there's still ice, um, and if it's iced out, then they'll land. It's an advantage for loons to come as early as they can in the spring, because um, that way, if any intruders try to come, they can be there first and they can fight those intruder off to secure their territory again. Loons typically do return to the same territory that they were on in previous years. Um, I believe the statistic there is it's about an 80% um, rate of return where, where about 80% of our loons will be coming back to the exact same territory they had been on. And so once they get back, they spend a couple of weeks um, doing courtship behaviors and reestablishing their pair bond. As far as we're aware, our male and female loons don't winter together. So they're coming back and they're sort of getting reacquainted with each other. Um, courtship in loons is really, really subtle though. So if you've ever seen a loon doing any sort of big splashy, flashy um, dance looking thing, probably that was not the loon and its mate, but rather a loon and a rival. Um, because again, courtship in loons is very, very subtle. 
um, and includes just sort of swimming around together peacefully. They might dive in sync with one another. They might do something called bill dipping, which is where they'll submerge just the very tip of their bill in the water towards each other and then pick their heads up and do that two or three times in a row. That seems to be a sort of deferential behavior to one another. Um, and then eventually they will start, you know, cruising around the shoreline and checking out nest sites. And um, for loons, our median date in New Hampshire of nest initiation is June 5th. So by June 5th of each year, typically about 50% of our loons are on their nest. Some are early birds and, you know, we do have nests that start in early May. Um, and similarly, we have some loons that tend to push off nesting until late June or even early July. But in general, loons are starting to nest in early June. They typically lay two eggs. In some cases, they'll only lay one. Uh, and in very, very rare cases, they may lay three. But most often it's two. And most often those two eggs are laid 12 to 24 hours apart. Um, loons don't start continuous incubation until their clutch is complete. And so sometimes we get calls from people who are concerned because their loons laid an egg but then they just left the nest and they haven't been back to it in a couple hours. That's totally normal. Um, they really only start incubating 24 seven once that second egg has been laid. Uh, and then once that happened, they will incubate for 26 to 28 days on average. Um, some are a little quicker, some are a little longer, but on average it's 26 to 28 days. And the male and the female loon are really sharing their incubation duties pretty equally. Um, towards the beginning of the incubation period, the male actually takes on a little bit more of the incubating. And we think it's because that female needs to uh, regain her strength after producing those two really big eggs, um, you know, making them, but also laying them. And so she needs a little bit more time to forage in those early days of the nesting period. But by the middle of the nesting period, things have evened out. And towards the hatch date, the female actually starts to take on very slightly more of the incubating than the male. Um, and because those eggs were laid 12 to 24 hours apart, they typically are also hatching 12 to 24 hours apart. Um, and so that re results in a dominant structure between the chicks where um, the first chick just is stronger because it's had a, a day of feeding on its sibling. And so um, as soon as that sibling hatches, that first chick is really letting it know that it's the boss and that it's gonna get fed first. Um, so we'll sometimes seeing, you know, one chick feeding on the other one and, and only letting the other one be fed after it's gotten its fill. And that can seem really cruel to us as humans watching, but it is a, um, it's a strategy that these loons have developed to ensure that in scarce years where food is not abundant, that at least one chick survives. Um, I will mention that if a loon's nest fails and about 40% of loon nests in New Hampshire do fail, they can and they do re-nest. Um, typically, we'll see re-nesting happening as late as early July. Um, so if your loons fail, especially early on in the season, fear not, they might have a second chance. So these chicks, when they hatch, they're what we call semi-precocial. So precocial in that they really only need a couple hours on the nest to dry off after hatching. And then they can get right in the water, they can swim right away. Um, they have their down already. They don't have to, you know, develop that. They have, uh, they are able to open their eyes right away, unlike some other birds. Um, and, you know, they can do a lot. They can even take short, shallow dives, but semi-precocial because um, they can't provide any of their own food, really. Especially in these early days, these chicks are about 100% are dependent on their parents for their food. And so, um, especially in the first two weeks, a scene like the one you're seeing here is very, very common with a chick on one parent's back and being fed pretty much continuously by the other parent. Um, chicks back ride for a couple of reasons. The first is um, just to rest. You know, they're very small, they don't have energy stores. And so if they can hop on and catch a ride with mom and dad and not have to paddle around, that's great for them. Second is temperature regulation. The lakes feel really great to us in the summer, but to a little, you know, loon chick that just weighs 100 grams, uh, it can get cold really quickly. And so being able to hop onto the parent's back and snuggle under its wings helps to keep them warm and, and you know, helps them to thermoregulate. 
And then the third is protection from underwater predators. So there are things in our lakes that, you know, will predate a loon chick if they get a chance, things like snapping turtles, but also uh, large fish will go after a loon chick. And so they're safer on top of the parents' backs. And so um, I mentioned that these chicks are about 100 grams when they hatch, and they have a lot of growing to do over the course of the season. So this photo shows a loon chick that's about six weeks old. It's much bigger than the one that we just saw. It's also starting to develop its plumage. Um, so we call, we, you know, we affectionately refer to this as the punk rock stage because you'll see these chicks going around with little uh, down mohawks as they lose that down and it's replaced by feathers. Um, the chick's bill has elongated and so it's starting to take on that more characteristic loon shape. And then you can't see it in this photo, but in the first couple of weeks of a loon chick's life, most of the energy that it's consuming goes towards growing its legs and its feet. And that is to help it uh, swim and dive better and just start being able to catch its own food. So the chick in this photo can provide probably 30 to 40% of its own diet, but it's still really, really heavily reliant on its parents. And so the behavior that it's doing in this photo is a form of begging. So anytime these chicks are hungry and want a meal from their parents, um, they'll go up to them and basically just be very obnoxious. They might um, just get right up in their face. They might headbutt them or otherwise nudge the parents in the, in the head and neck with their own head. Um, they might bite the parent's neck. And I've even seen a picture of a loon chick biting its parent's bill to get its attention and, and to let it know that it wants to be fed. Um, so those begging behaviors persist um, until the chick is almost full grown. And so by the time our chicks are 12 weeks old, they look like this. Um, they're not the size of an adult just yet, but they're pretty close to it. Um, all of their down has been replaced by this first set of plumage, and they've really taken on that characteristic loon shape with the um, elongated bill. They have very large feet. Um, their bodies have elongated. And at this point in the summer, you might see them starting to practice flight so that they can build up their um, muscles in preparation for their first migration. At this point, they can catch 100% of their own food, although they can and do um, still beg their parents for a free meal when they can get it. And at this point in the summer, usually around late August, early September, um, but sometimes later than that, sometimes into October, the parents will actually leave. Um, and so one loon typically leaves first and the, the remaining adult stays with the chicks for another week or two, but then that parent leaves too. And these chicks are on their own to try to figure out how to get to their wintering grounds, um, which seems like a daunting task considering that they've never been there. So they must be hatched with, um, you know, just that innate knowledge and instinct of how to get there. We do often see loon chicks grouping up on larger lakes in the fall, and that might be a strategy developed to, you know, help improve the chances that they get to their wintering grounds, uh, a safety in numbers sort of thing. The last thing I wanna point out here is that you may notice that these chicks in this plumage look pretty similar to the adult in its, um, its winter plumage, that gray drab, um, those feathers. The way to tell them apart is that the chicks have uh, a white tip to the edge of their feathers that creates a scalloped looking pattern. Um, and if I go back to where the adult in its breeding plumage was, it doesn't have those scallops. Um, and so that is a good way to tell your chicks apart from any adults that might be on the lake later in the season if those adults have, um, you know, gone through most of their molt. Oh. Okay, so now that we've covered sort of the season and the, oh, actually, um, one more thing I should mention here is that once these chicks get to their wintering grounds, they stay there for three years. Um, three years is when a loon becomes reproductively mature. It's when they first develop that um, breeding plumage, and it's when they come back to start looking for a lake of their own. Uh, studies from Wisconsin have indicated that loon chicks will typically return to a lake within about 20 to 25 miles of where they were hatched. So they're not coming back to their, um, you know, the exact place that they hatched from, but they're coming to the general vicinity. 
Okay, so unfortunately, loons do face a variety of threats to their reproductive success as well as to their survival when they're on our lakes. Um, so I just want to run through some of those. And I like to use this photo to start off with because it shows um, one of the body adaptations that loons have that you make them really great in the water, but make them very, very vulnerable when they're on land nesting. Um, and that is the positioning of their legs. So if this bird were a goose or a duck, um, its legs would be positioned about mid body, right? And that would allow it to walk upright um, and balance and be able to move well on land. Loon legs are about as far back on their bodies as they possibly could be. And so in the water, that's a great thing because it allows them to really um, maximize the amount of propulsion they get with every kick. But on land, it means that they're not able to walk upright. Um, their center of gravity is totally off. And so if you've ever seen a loon walk on land, it's very awkward. Um, they sort of flop their bellies down and then just push themselves with their feet through the mud. And so if you've seen a loon get off of its nest, you might notice that its chest and belly is covered in dirt um, because that's how they have to move. They just sort of slog through. And so that is number one, a very energy, um, intensive way of moving. It, it takes up a lot of energy. And number two, it's a slow way of moving, which makes them very vulnerable, right? If a loon was far inland and was approached by a predator, that loon would basically have no chance of um, escaping. And so because of those two things, to, to be less vulnerable to predation and also to save energy, loons tend to build their nests right on the water's edge. And on a natural lake where, you know, if there are a couple days of heavy rains, loons can still reach into the, the muck and build up their nest to keep pace with water level changes, um, that works out okay. But on lakes that are dammed, where those water level changes can occur much um, more rapidly or can be much more severe, it can be a problem for loons. And we have seen loon nests be flooded and also um, being stranded. And so stranded is just when the water level falls so much that the loons just can't keep going back and forth to it. And so they uh, abandon their nest. So water level fluctuations have been a problem for loon reproductive success, both here in New Hampshire and throughout the rest of their range. Another big problem is human disturbance. So a loon that is nesting and is feeling relaxed will be sitting upright on its nest. It's probably gonna be you know, turning its head and looking around its territory. A loon that is feeling threatened will assume the position that you're seeing in this photo. Uh, and we call that hangover position. And so this loon's trying to do two things. Number one, it's trying to minimize its appearance in hopes that whatever it's perceiving as a threat is not going to see it. And it's also getting in a, into a position where all it has to do is kick its feet and it's, it's back in the water, right? It's sort of a diving position. Um, and so if you ever see a loon doing this while you're on the water, it may be triggered by your presence. And the best thing to do is just back away um, and keep backing away until that loon resumes an upright position. Um, in cases where the threat does not leave the area, the loons can be flushed off of the nest where they just, they feel too threatened, they're feeling vulnerable and they get off of their nest into the water where they're um, able to move better and are therefore safer. But in doing that, they leave their eggs vulnerable to opportunistic predators and also to temperature changes that could cause the embryo to die. So the, the, those eggs could overheat or they could chill. Um, and become inviable. So the goal is to keep loons on their nests, um, you know, doing what they're supposed to be doing, which is incubating. Um, and so, yeah, if you ever seen a, see a loon doing this, just know that it needs a little more space. We typically recommend um, about 150 feet. There are some other threats to our nesting loons as well. So shoreline development, loons just happen to like to nest in the same areas that we like to build our houses and our docks and our beaches. Um, and so on lakes where the shoreline has been intensively developed, loons are often dr driven into using more marginal nesting habitat where they might be more vulnerable to predators or just other things that cause them to fail. Human commensal mammals, so things like raccoons that have been around always, but now are around in higher densities due to having human sources of food like garbage. Um, those are opportunistic predators of loon eggs. And so more of them around just sort of increases that risk of predation. Avian predators, uh, so crows, ravens, gulls uh, will all predate loon eggs. Eagles will predate loon chicks. 
Um, and so at LPC, we're not anti-crow, raven, gull, or eagle at all. Um, we'd rather loons be dealing with those natural threats as opposed to the human caused threats. But in the presence of all those human caused threats, um, you know, it's just sort of one more straw on the camel's back having those avian predators as well. Contaminants is uh, an area of active research for us at LPC. So every year we collect all of the inviable loon eggs in the state, the ones that don't hatch, that are abandoned. Um, and we're able to test a small subset of those for certain contaminants, including PFAS, PCBs, DDT, uh, among others. And what we found is that on some lakes, the levels of those contaminants in the loon eggs exceed the levels that have been found to cause negative reproductive effects on other bird species. So we don't yet know what the levels are that are important and cause reproductive impacts on loons. It's something that we're you know, actively researching right now, but it's definitely a concern that those contaminants are showing up in such high levels in our loon eggs. Um, and if you'd like to learn more about that, there's a whole hour long talk about it on the Loon Preservation Committee YouTube channel. Uh, and then another threat and really the biggest threat to loons here in New Hampshire and a large threat in other states as well is lead fishing tackle. So every year LPC collects every uh, dead loon that is reported to us in the state and we take it for a necropsy. Um, that's an autopsy for an animal and we work with the veterinary diagnostic lab at UNH as well as um, staff and students at the Cummings School for Veterinary Medicine at Tufts to get these necropsies done. And what we've found is that since 1989 when we really intensively started doing this necropsying, 42% um, of the adult loons that have been documented to have died in New Hampshire, died from the ingestion of lead fishing tackle. Um, a loon will typically die within two to four weeks of ingesting a lead object. It's nearly always fatal. We've only had one case where the loon was rescued and treated and survived. Um, and that was because that loon was caught really early. Usually loons don't start showing the symptoms of lead poisoning until it's too late to save them. Um, so 42% of our adult loons that have died that we've documented to have died anyway, have died from lead fishing tackle. It dwarfs all other causes of mortality in loons in New Hampshire. Um, and so here I have some radiographs that just show the lead objects that killed each of these loons. The one on the right was actually from Lake Winnipesaukee a couple years ago. Um, it was found at Black Cat Island as a rescue and unfortunately it died um, as it was being transported to the vet. And so all of these adult mortalities are a really big problem for our loons. And the reason that they're a big problem has to do with loon life history. So loons are a classic example of, we call, of what we call a K-selected species. Uh, and so what does that mean? Well, number one, they're long lived. So uh, we actually don't know yet the, the normal lifespan of a loon, but we suspect it's somewhere around 25 to 30 years old. Uh, we really only started banding loons in the 1980s, late 80s, early 90s. And we still have several of those, that initial cohort of banded loons uh, around. So the oldest known loon in New Hampshire is a female that was banded as an adult on Lake Umbagog in 1993. And so at that point, uh, she was at least three years old, but probably uh, six years old or more because she had chicks and loons typically aren't producing chicks until they're about six. Um, and so she's probably about 34 years old this year. And we have several other loons in New Hampshire that are in their late twenties. And so loons are a long lived species. And then, as I mentioned, they have a delayed age of reproduction. Typically they're not producing chicks until they're six years old. Uh, and they have a really slow rate of reproduction. So at absolute maximum, a loon pair is going to be producing two chicks in a given year. But what we found from our long-term data is that the average pair here in New Hampshire is only fledging one chick every other year. Um, and so that's a really slow rate of adding to the population, right? And that means that the survival of the ad adults is really, really important to maintaining and sustaining and growing the population. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about the population modeling studies that we've done to um, figure out how all of these loon deaths have impacted New Hampshire's population. We have another hour long talk on, talk on the Loon Preservation Committee YouTube channel about that. Um, but suffice to say, 
our population is growing much slower than it would have been had those 159 adult loons not died uh, and not been removed from our population prematurely. Uh, because we lost not only those, those adults, but also any future uh, offspring that they would have produced. So now that we've talked about all those threats, let's talk a little bit about the things that are being done to address them. So again, I work at the Loon Preservation Committee. We are a nonprofit organization founded in 1975 in response to a really dramatic decline in New Hampshire's loon population. At that point, there were fewer than 100 pairs of loons left in the state, which was much lower than historic levels and much lower than what we think is the carrying capacity um, for loons in the state. And the founding principle behind LPC was that if human actions had contributed to the decline in loons, um, and it seemed very likely that they had, then human actions could also help to reverse those declines. Um, and so LPC works to do that. And we have a multiple pronged uh, approach to that. So I'll just briefly cover some of the different work that we do. First is management. So you've probably seen a loon raft around Lake Winnipesaukee. We float many of them on the lake each year. And these rafts are designed to help with a lot of the problems that I mentioned earlier that um, threaten reproductive success. So they rise and fall with water levels. Um, they're anchored 20 to 30 feet offshore. So that doesn't guarantee that, uh, you know, some mammal isn't going to swim out and predate the eggs, but it does make it a little bit less likely. Um, and studies have shown that predation rates are lower on nest rafts. It's got a cover overhead to uh, camouflage the loon and provide a little bit of a barrier from avian predators. And then on lakes that have been really intensively developed, it provides a new island nesting site for the loons to try out. Um, that is not going to get developed on, right? No one's building a house on this loon raft. So um, the rafts are floated to help deal with the whole suite of problems. And uh, last year, LPC staff and our volunteers floated 85 loon rafts throughout the state. Um, I want to say 10 to 12 of those were on Winnipesaukee, and we actually added a few new rafts on Winnipesaukee this year as well um, to other loon territories that needed the help. We'll also put out signs to help uh, reduce human disturbance at nest sites. Um, so these signs are just intended to let people know that they really should not be getting any closer to that loon nest. Um, and in some cases where human disturbance has continued, even in the presence of sign, we might also put out the, the rope lines. And these are just intended to uh, reinforce the message of the sign by providing a physical barrier that really says, you know, hey, you don't go closer to this uh, than this to that, that loot nest. We do a lot of public education and outreach. So in addition to giving presentations like the one I'm giving tonight, we also um, have some other education and outreach methods. So the picture here shows a Squam Lake Loon Cruise, which is a collaborative effort between us and the Squam Lakes Natural Science Center, where folks can go out with our Squam Lake biologist, Tiffany, um, and learn about loons while watching loons. And it's been a really cool way to uh, you know, increase education about loons on our lakes. We also have a live loon cam, which is streaming now. So if you are interested in getting a really up close and personal view of um, a pair of nesting loons in New Hampshire, that is live streaming on our YouTube channel. And we're actually about to start up a second loon cam. We typically have two per year. Um, and the loon cam is really cool because it allows people to watch loons really closely without negatively impacting them. Um, and you get to see all kinds of cool stuff, including really great views of the hatching process. I like including this picture because um, the first chick has hatched. And if you look at the egg over here, you'll see a white spot near the tip. And that's where that second chick is actually starting to break out. Um, so really cool, intimate view of that nesting and hatching process. We've done a lot of work to try to reduce lead tackle mortalities for New Hampshire's loons. So LPC's data and testimony was used to get a series of lead laws passed, uh, the most recent in 2013, which banned the sale and the use in fresh water of lead sinkers and lead headed jigs uh, weighing one ounce or less. That's the size range that's been found to kill loons. Um, but of course, just because it's no longer legal to buy them doesn't mean that people don't have tackle from, you know, prior to that ban going into effect. And so to try to encourage people to make the right choice and switch to lead-free tackle, uh, we've been offering a lead tackle buyback program. 
um, and the lead tackle buyback is running this year. Um, and people can go to a participating retailer and turn in one ounce or more of that illegal tackle. And in exchange, they get a $10 voucher to that shop. So if you've got tackle in, that's lead in your tackle box, or if you know someone that might, please do encourage them to go to loonsafe.org to find um, our list of participating retailers and you know, make the switch to Loon Safe Tackle. We do loon rescues. So um, if you ever see a loon out on the lake that's tangled in fishing line or is beaching itself or otherwise is in distress, please do give us a call um, so that we can go and you know, check on that loon and rescue it if necessary and try to untangle it or address the other problem that it's dealing with. Um, you can either email us, you can, we have a loon distress form on our website that you can use or you can give us a call. Um, I'm going to fly through these because I think I'm getting close to time, um, but we do a lot of different research pro projects involving loons, um, banning and tracking loons, which allows us to learn more about their life history, how long they live, um, you know, where they go, if they're kicked off of their territory, how many chicks they produce over the course of their lifetime, um, and other really cool information we get from banning and tracking loons, looking into causes of loon mortality, so that we can detect any emerging threats and hopefully hopefully uh, find ways to um, uh, prevent those threats if they're human caused. Effects of climate change on loon reproduction, loons are a northern species. We in New Hampshire are very close to the southern extent of their breeding range and so as things warm up it might become less hospitable for loons and so we're looking into um, how temperature and precipitation patterns affect their reproduction. Effects of contaminants on loons. Again, we have a full talk on this on our website uh, or on our YouTube channel if you're interested in learning more about that. We work with Jim Haney's lab at UNH. Um, every time we ban loons, we take a blood sample and we send some of that blood to, to Jim and his students and they look at cyanotoxins um, in it as part of their work on cyano blooms in New Hampshire. Effects of lead on loon survival and population growth rates. We're continuing to um, document how many loons are dying from that and you know the sizes of the tackle that they're dying from uh, and causes of nest failure so similar to the causes of mortality we're just trying to document why loon nests are failing so that we can potentially develop new management strategies to ad address any um, emerging causes of nest failure and then we do monitoring so um, this is just counting loons basically counting how many pairs of loons we have in the state uh, how many of those pairs nest, because it turns out not every pair nests, only about two thirds of um, our loon pairs will nest in a given year. Um, how many chicks hatch from those nests, how many of those chicks survive to the end of the summer, and then we also collect data on nest sites. Um, so, you know, how, how much vertical distance is there between the nest and the water, how much horizontal distance, how much overhead cover does it have, and lateral cover, um, and other things like that. Um, and so the monitoring also helps us to keep an eye on how the population is doing and, and whether or not our management strategies have been effective. Um, and so this graph is a little bit confusing because it tells you the number of paired adults. So you have to, or for that dark blue line anyway. So you have to divide that by two to get the number of loon pairs. Um, but back when we started in 1975, there were fewer than 100 pairs of loons left in New Hampshire. Um, and in 2020, we documented 321 pairs. So our population has more than tripled. Um, and you know, we still do have a long way to go to get back to historic levels, but we're getting there. It's a slow growth, but you know, our population is growing. And so hopefully if I've done my job right, you're you know, wondering how you might be able to help loons. Um, and so there are some sort of more general ways and then some more specific ways you could get involved in our work. So the general things, um, use only non-lead loon safe fishing tackle. That is the number one thing you can do to help loons um, and encourage others that you know that might be anglers to do the same. Give loons space, um, 150 feet or more um, while they're on the water with their chicks or while they're on the nest. Um, again, those chicks need to do a lot of growing from the time they hatch to the time they're ready to fledge. And so the parents have to be diving pretty much consistently and coming up with food to feed them. And when people get too close to them um, to take a picture or just to get a good look at them, 
the parent gets distracted and you know the loons have to sort of focus on moving away from that boat instead of focusing on feeding their chicks. Um, and so it's best to just give them you know as much space as possible to ensure that they're able to raise their chicks successfully. Um, learning to interpret loon behaviors that indicate they might need more space. So uh, that hangover position on the nest, loons will also um, do what we call the penguin posture when they're feeling threatened on the water. So you might see a, an adult loon rear up and uh, show off that bright white belly and paddle its feet really quickly. That's a distraction display. So if that's going on, um, that loon needs some more space. Um, and then if you were interested in volunteering with the Loon Preservation Committee, we do have a lot of things that we need volunteer help with. Um, our biologists are really busy. They have 12 weeks to survey um, a whole bunch of lakes or uh, in the Winnipesaukee biologist's case to survey uh, about 26 loon territories. And so we rely a lot on volunteers to keep us updated with what their loons are doing, whether they're nesting or if the nest is hatched or failed, if the chicks are surviving. Um, and so if anyone was interested in doing that on Winnie, your um, biologist this year is Griffin Archambault, and he can be reached at winnipesaukee at loon.org with any loon sightings. Um, we float all of those rafts um, and it's <laughs> pretty exhausting. So if anyone was interested in helping to float a raft, retrieve a raft, or help us store it for the winter so that we don't have to bring it back to the loon center and then um, haul it back out the next year, that's always really helpful. Um, and the same goes for the signs that we'll put out. Um, and then, you know, if you're interested in volunteering, but none of those sound great, um, you can always send me an email at volunteers at loon.org um, and we can find something that works for you. So that's all I had prepared, but I'm really glad to take any questions that anyone might have. Um, and I will stop my screen share to do that. Caroline, I had a question, well, two. Sure. So in general, how would you say loons are doing on Winnipesaukee? Are they increasing, staying stable? Yeah, so the number of pairs is more or less stable. Um, really what we're looking at on Winnipesaukee is that hatching success. Um, and so it's sort of variable year to year. Um, and a little bit more variable than on some of the smaller lakes, which makes sense, right? Because in addition to um, the threats that the smaller lakes are dealing with, Winnipesaukee is also dealing with the fact that there are so many loons on the same lake. We do see a lot of uh, interloon fighting on Winnie. Um, but in general, it's been doing pretty well the last couple of years. Um, there, there were some years when we had a low number of chicks like two years ago, we had just six chicks hatched on the lake and only one of those survived to the end of the season, which was a terrible year. That was two years ago. But last year we were back up to where we normally are, which is about 15 chicks uh, fledging in a given year. Um, more hatch, but raising a chick from, from you know hatch to that 12 week age can be tough on a big lake um, and a lake that's really busy. So. Um, I would say the, the biggest thing we can do other than not using lead tackle on Winnipesaukee is just really respecting those loon space uh, because that has been something that's been a problem. Mm. Okay, thanks. I had one other sort of question. Sure. I, was, I was out um, training a new uh, volunteer water quality monitor a couple of weeks ago and we were down in Alton area mm -hmm. and there was a loon with a really weird distress call that I've never heard. And it, it wasn't anything you shared tonight. So I don't know what was bothering this loon. We didn't see anything in the water or anything near it. it was, hmm. But it was really upset. <laughs> yeah, was it doing any behaviors along with that call? Like, was it splashing around a lot or was it just- A, a little bit of splashing, but it was really, um calling out quite loudly and a, a very strange noise i don't know hmm that's yeah. really interesting i'm sorry I, I don't know what would have i know uh, it was interesting. It. i don't know what it was but we know a lot about loons but there's still a lot to learn yeah. for sure can i can i offer something as a possibility um yes. at the lake in maine where i grew up they, we have loons and they have eagles and my cousin has watched the eagles unfortunately take the loon chick 
And he said that was the most unbelievably sad sound he had ever heard in his life. So I wonder if maybe there was an eagle in the area that you may not have seen and, and maybe the, the mother loon was trying to scare away the, uh, the eagle. I, I don't know, we, we couldn't see anything in the area, but it was a very distressed call. Yeah. Yeah, they will. I mean, um, yeah, as much as we love the fact that, you know, the eagle population has rebounded because it's a really big feat for conservation. Um, yeah, those eagles will definitely take a loon chick if they can get it. Um, there was a report from Maine last year. I don't know, it got a lot of uh, news attention because this doesn't happen very often, but what they found in the water was um, a dead loon chick, but also floating nearby a dead eagle that had been stabbed by a loon. So it seems like that eagle had gone after the chick, the adult loon had tried to protect its chip, chick, um, and in the process had killed the eagle, but not before the eagle got the chick. So um, the loons can win. It's it's pretty rare that the, the loons win that fight, but they can. And the adults can, you know, defend their chicks from the eagles. We see it all the time. We've gotten pictures of loons stabbing up at eagles and not killing the eagle, but scaring it off so that it didn't get those chicks. So they're not totally defenseless. Um, but yeah, those eagles can can definitely get those chicks, and it is pretty heartbreaking to to watch and to hear the loons react to that. Could I ask one other question, please? Yes. One of the things I've noticed being out on the lake um, in, in a kayak in the morning is loons will gather together, and they kind of and they kind of work their way across the lake like they're like they're fishing or having breakfast together. It's like a little loon buffet as they they come across the lake. Is that is that a common occurrence that they would socialize like that? Yeah, so it's a little more common on the bigger lakes where there are multiple pairs, they might do a check in. Um, and are you familiar with the the circle dance behavior that loons do? Yeah, a bit, yeah. Are you seeing them do that as their um, So the circle dance for those who don't know is when loons, it's a very low level territorial interaction. So when loons are, um, when an intruder is coming in and trying to usurp a territory from a loon that is present on that territory, uh, it doesn't just come in and start attacking that loon. What happens is they go through this sort of ritualized set of different behaviors that they're using to try to assess the other loon's strength. And one of those things is the circle dance, uh, where loons will group up and they'll sort of start swimming in a circle, which is why it's called the circle dance. Um, and one loon might dive under, and when that first loon dives under, the other loons, however many of them there are, will immediately put their heads underwater. And what they're doing is, is looking to make sure that that loon that dove isn't coming up from below to stab them. And typically once one loon dives, they all dive, and then they all resurface, and they look sort of frantic, and they might repeat that. Um, so that's something that we do often see throughout the course of the breeding season um, is loons getting together and circle dancing. And when you see that, you know, it's probably an intruding loon coming in um, and assessing whether or not it can take those other loons in a fight. It's looking at their reaction times. It's looking at, you know, how good of a swimmer are they? How strong do they seem? And things like that. Um, so if you're seeing that, probably an intruding loon. If you're seeing them just be more or less peaceful, but they're grouped up, it's probably loons that um, are from neighboring territories and sort of know each other and are just socializing. Um, and then later in the season, when we get to August or September, when those loons that have not been successful for the season um, realize that it's not going to happen, they're not going to have chicks, they become less attached to their territory and they start moving around more um, and congregating, especially on big lakes. We'll see groups of 15 loons, 20 loons on Winnipesaukee um, later in the season. And that's all of those loons that have not been successful in hatching and raising chicks, all just sort of getting together. And um, it's been hypothesized that they're sharing information with each other about what which loon territories have been successful that year. Um, because what's been found is that loon territories that are successful are more likely to have intrusions from other loons in subsequent years. Um, and so it's possible that those, those unsuccessful loons are, are sharing information in that way. Although I don't know how you would prove that, but that's something that's been hypothesized. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for the question. 
Do we have any other questions either um, by voice or by chat? Not seeing anything in the chat. All right, well, if we don't have any other questions, um, then I guess we can end the meeting for the night. We do have a recording of it available. So um, if you know someone that you think might enjoy it, you can send me an email at volunteers at loon.org and I'm glad to um, share the link to the video with you. I can also share it with um, Pat and LWA. Um, yeah, and, and if you have any questions about loons that you think of after we end the meeting, feel free to email me as well. Um, and I'm glad to answer those. Thank you, Caroline. We appreciate it. And we certainly would like to share the link to this on our website as well. Yeah, absolutely. I'll get it to you. All right. Thank you. Great. Well, everybody have a great night. Thank you for coming. Great job. Thank you. Thank much. you. Thank you.